Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Well, welcome aboard. Uh, is this coming through, Ash? Just coming through? Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to take your seats, we're going to get started on the meeting tonight because, as normal, we always run out of time at the end. So let's uh, try to get going as promptly as possible. Okay, thank you, everyone. Oh, there you go. Go to the old technology. Welcome, everyone. Um, we've just run the video, so uh, welcome to our June meeting. I don't know whether anyone knows what this might be. Any guesses? Suntan Salon? Someone? This is Acrux One undergoing solar testing. It's getting it launched theoretically tomorrow on, on Rocket Lab. So I think we're at one o'clock local time, Melbourne time. Uh, CubeSat. So that should be pretty exciting. Okay, we've got a big uh, meeting tonight, and um, so we'll just get started pretty quickly. First of all, we're going to have uh, Space Association news. There's lots of news tonight, so once again, we're going to be powering through that pretty quickly. Um, got a lot of news on the Apollo 11 50th anniversary, which is in July, of course. Then we've got our two features, which is our continuing footsteps to the moon, countdown to Apollo 11. And then we've got another presentation by Andrew Rennie talking about the whole concept of the Lunar Orbit Rendezvous decision architecture of, of how to get Apollo to the moon. And it's a fascinating story. I had a sneak pre preview the other day and it's uh, really interesting. So looking forward to seeing that. Um, we've also got another special guest, James Kirby and the team from Hive Engineering at RMIT talking about their success at the Australian University's rocket competition. Love saying that. Then we're going to have a bit of a break at 8.45 if we sort of try and stay on schedule. So uh, during the break, please go and find someone you haven't spoken to before. Introduce yourself. Uh, you might find out uh, something new and interesting. Because it's a very interesting, diverse group of people at this, uh, these meetings. And then after that, we're going to have our Space News Part 1, which is the Space Industry Update with Angelo. And then Planetary and Space Science, we see Andrew Rennie again. And then we're going to get kicked out on the street at 10 p.m., although they might let us stay around for a little while. Um, so we'll get started with, um, with what's happening. <coughs> um, as you're probably all aware, um, the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing, John, is uh, coming up uh, in July of the... Of, well, July this month. So uh, there's... Um, seats around there's some seats here if you want to sort of swing around or at the back there um so that's happening in july now i'm i'm afraid i'm going to fess up to some fake news there was this post on facebook about futura being the font of choice for nasa in the 60s and i committed to making my powerpoint futura it is futura but when i transferred onto this pc it doesn't seem to have futura loaded so we've got a different font so sorry about that okay so i digress um, so to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 mission, we've got several things happening here in Melbourne, and I'm going to talk about things elsewhere in the country as well. So on the 10th of July, that's a Tuesday night, I believe, um, there's going to be a, a Royal Aeronautical Society... I think it's a Wednesday. It's a Wednesday. Uh, ...partnered with the American Institute of Astronautics and Aeronautics and the Space Association. They're putting uh, a session together. I'll go more details on that in a moment. Then we've got the Sun Theatre in Yarraville. We've been working very closely with them. They're running what they're calling the Moon Film Festival, which runs from the 16th to the 25th of July, which is coincidentally, not coincidentally, exactly, the same same timeline as the Apollo 11 mission from launch to landing, so um, nice. Andrew Rennie's doing a thing over at Glenroy Library on the 18th. We're still working. We think there still might be something happening, but we don't know, on SBS Slow TV, showing the, uh, the moon landing live. We don't know. And the association, we've got a lot of details on this today, uh, moon landing live, a special presentation on the 21st of July. So let's get started with the Moon Film Festival. That's over at the Sun Theatre in Yarraville. Michael Smith is the uh, owner and... I'll get the chalk dust out. And you're probably, you're all old enough to know what, exactly what that means, so sorry about that. Um, so we've got this Moon Film Festival, which is running a whole series of films over there during the period of the mission. Um, they're also going to have some displays and other things happening. Keep your eye out for a, a lunar rover. I won't say too much more, but... Um, hey? um, 
So this is a little promo they put together on their Moon Film Festival. Looks good. Uh, well, I've had a sneak preview of Apollo 11. It's spectacular. I haven't seen Armstrong yet, so that's going to be good as well. And there's a whole bunch of other things there that are going to be quite fun. So if you're not familiar with Melbourne and where the Sun Theatre is, it's over in Yarraville. It's not that far away. It's over the other side of the Yarra, I know, but it's not that far away. And it's a beautiful little sort of village area, and there's a street out the front of the theatre, and it's going to be a really nice, uh, nice venue. And there's a train station right there. So, you know, if you're taking public transport, it's not that hard. All right, so the movies, I'll just whiz through them quickly. Apollo 11, these are the times. The right, the right stuff, Armstrong, which is this one I haven't seen and it's supposed to be quite, quite good. I don't think it's been screened in Australia before. And Moon, which I think has been, would have been shown a, what, a few months ago, a few years ago. Then we've got The Dish, all familiar with The Dish. Fun movie, not, not a documentary, but a good fun movie anyway. Uh, I spoke to Neil Armstrong about the dish and he actually really liked it. He thought it was a good film. He really enjoyed it. He acknowledged that it wasn't a factual documentary, but he did really enjoy it. Um, the Other Side of the Moon, I don't think I've seen that. That's supposed to be quite good. First Man, uh, that came out a couple of years ago and widely, um, widely uh, acknowledged as a, as a great movie. Different opinions, I suppose. Moonwalk One, this is really, really nice. This is, I think it's a new digital transfer of that original film from the 60s so that should be quite good and then we've got moon landing live our event we'll give you more details of that and i'm not sure what that is but anyway that's a ufo and then hidden figures that came out a couple of years ago apollo 13 of course apollo 13 that's about like 20 odd 25 years ago now isn't it scary and 2001 a space odyssey just for the old timers, like us. Okay, so Moon Landing Live. This is a Space Association's signature event. Uh, we're calling it for the for Melbourne, and it's going to co coincide with precisely to the second the actual moonwalk as it happened 50 years ago. So, the actual events of the day took place on these timelines here in Melbourne or in the east coast of Australia. So we're going to be. So we're going to be coordinating and synchronising our presentation with that precisely. So Sun Theatre are taking care of the tickets. I think if you're on our mailing list, you would have received a link with a discount. Uh, you can buy the tickets at discount, although they are for sale on their public website as well. But uh, you're more than welcome, even if you're not a member, to share that with anybody. It's fine. We're all one big happy family here. So that should be good. Tickets are going well, and um, there's still plenty of tickets available, but you know, it's going to get pretty tight as we get close, I'm sure. So the Moon Landing Live schedule, uh, at this stage, we've got uh, Noon, we'll be starting everything. We're going to be playing the Powered, uh, powered Descent insertion, which is obviously didn't happen at that time. It happened earlier in the morning, but we'll be running a nice documentary running and going through that. Uh, then we're going to kick on with the actual uh, moonwalk itself uh, at 12.53, literally, as I say, to the second. So you can relive it if you weren't there the first time and, or if you were and you were too little. Um, uh, the whole TV coverage. Uh, and then we're going to finish at about 5 p.m. And in amongst that, there's going to be a whole bunch of other fun things as well. Um, there will be screening the Apollo 11 movie afterwards, but it won't be ticketed as part of our event. So if you want to see that afterwards, stay around. We need a separate ticket, that's all. 
so this is what it's going to be looking like. We're doing simulations out there. This is going to be at the Barclay Cinema over there, which is 170 odd seats, I think, 180 seats. Uh, and the details are going to be like this. So um, once again, they're handling the tickets, uh, part of their festival. We're going to, be having, going to be having some limited catering, finger food, that sort of thing. So you'll be able to go out there and grab something to eat and go back in and have a drink and things like that. Two alcoholic drinks are included. If you want to hit the Terps, you can go and buy that as well. But um, please be responsible. No, no chewing gum on the seats. We'll come after you. Um, so the prices are $35 for the Great Unwashed. And for you exclusive people here, oh, people on the screen, stream, sorry, you're not unwashed, um, $28 for us. Uh, and once again, that link is out there, so if you want to get hold of that, feel free to share it. Um, seats over here, seats over there, whatever you Thanks. All right, so the Royal Aeronautical Society event on the Wednesday the 10th, uh, in partnership with us and the American Institute of Astronautics and Aeronautics and Engineers Australia, they're going to have John Sarkassian, who's uh, the operations scientist at CSIRO up at Parks. He's going to be calling his presentation, Dishing Up the Data. Um, it is a free event, but you do need to go to their Eventbrite uh, page and get a ticket, so uh, 6 to 9 p.m. So that should be quite good. This is John, great guy, very knowledgeable, and um, I'm sure he'll give you the full facts of what happened at the dish and parks and, uh, and Tibbin Billa. Andrew Rennie will be shooting over to Glenroy for his presentation over there at uh, Glenroy Library. So I think that's a free event, Andrew. I haven't heard anything about tickets or anything. No. It's free. Yeah, it's free. So head over there. And then we've just found out that ScienceWorks are doing something special on the 20th of July. Um, so that doors open at 6 p.m. Uh, they're going to have a planetarium show. They're going to have a panel discussion in the amphitheatre, which is actually kind of outside. So. 20th of July, it might be chilly, so make sure you take your coat. The panel will have uh, Robin Williams as the moderator and uh, Brian Duffy and Dr. Gail Isles, who was involved in the Apollo 11 mission. Um, and they'll be talking about that. Um, she, so she wasn't involved in the Apollo 11 mission. She was involved with NASA later on, but she's going to be talking about the Apollo 11 mission. So um, now the ABC, we've just found out, of doing quite a bit of stuff as well. They've got Stargazing Live, the moon and beyond on the... 16th of July at 8 p.m. with Julian Zamero and Brian Cox. And then there's also going to be um, this pocket guide to the moon, um, digital and other channels. Uh, Fly Me to the Moon on Tuesday the 16th on the at 9 p.m. This will be on ABC TV. Um, this should be quite good because there's going to be some of the original trackers that were involved in Apollo 11 uh, as part of this as well. Mike Dean and John Saxon and those people that may or may not know those people, they'll be involved apparently, and I'm not sure, I haven't seen it, but um, so they've tapped into the treasure trove of ABC radio and TV archives, so should be quite good. So I suggest you take the entire month off work or school and just watch TV and come to events and just totally get sick of Apollo 11. Fly Me to the Moon on the 16th uh, with, uh, on TV once again, Dr Philip Chapman, Paul Scully Powers and Andy Thomas, three Australian born, they weren't citizens, but they were born Australian, uh, flew in, well, two of them flew in space, Chapman didn't. He was actually recruited in the Apollo era and was undergoing Apollo training back in the 60s, but unfortunately he never flew. I believe he still lives in the States. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. So that should be fascinating. Now, the, the sort of the main sort of uh, event here in Australia, as we kind of mentioned before, the TV from the moon came through um, Australia, came through originally uh, through Honeysuckle Creek and then went over to Parks as, it, as the moon rose. So Honeysuckle Creek and Parks sort of share the glory of the, of the TV coming from the moon. Although Pasadena, California, they did get a, a little bit at the start, but it was upside down, so... They got rid of that. <laughs> um, so the people, some of the people that were involved in 1969, twiddling the knobs, connecting with Houston, piping the TV and data through, are going to be at this thing. And in fact, they're organising it up in Canberra. So that's the 16th to the 25th. Um, they're going to have a visit out to Honeysuckle Creek. They're going to have a, a moonwalk lunch 
similar to what we're doing on the 21st. So if you're able to be there or you are in Canberra, go along. Go to that website and you can get all the details. You can buy tickets. I think they're going to be cutting off ticket sales at the end of the month, if I'm not wrong. So if you do want to go to that, uh, meet these guys. Uh, fascinating. So their program is Thursday the 18th. They're going to be um, what are, uh, orientation day. Uh, the Friday will be various Canberra visits, Questacon, etc. Um, Saturday they're going out to Tibbin Villa and Hayden Creek. And then on the Sunday they've got their big afternoon, once again coinciding with the actual Moonwalk Day. Flipping over to the other side of the country, over at uh, Carnarvon, uh, they're putting a bit of a shindig on. Uh, 21st and 22nd, 20th and 21st, I can't read my own. They're going to have a presentation over there, cocktail party, uh, ex trackers, and that cost is $50 per person for that. So once again, if you're there or know somebody's over there, flip up to Carnarvon. I haven't been there myself, but uh, you have? You, oh, John's going. You're going? Yeah. With John Swanee over here, one of the original guys. In the break, have a chat to John. He's a fascinating guy, and he's going over to Carnarvon. So there's the dates there. This is a bit of a look at Carnarvon as it stands today. Some of the old, the old dish and some of the antennas and things there. So they've got quite a bit of backing from the state government, the tourist board. So they've got quite a nice display over there in the museum. Now, you may or may not have known now, Shane, this is your chance to shine. This is Shane Usher. Usher. He's a professional model. Um, he's going to show our Apollo 11 logo. <laughs> which now has been made available on a t-shirt. And um, so the idea here is that it shows the, uh, the command module shape, now the back is um, showing Australia and New Zealand, Australian American flags, obviously symbolizing the cooperation. The uh, dish at Honeysuckle Creek, which took the first TV, lunar module obviously. And so we've uh, put that on some t-shirts, they're available for purchase. We've only got a limited number here. And we've also got um, commemorative cup, which Members of the association, as of July the 7th, will be um, entitled to, uh, to get free one of those. So they'll be either sent to you or picked up uh, at the July meeting. Uh, so these, a um, bit of incentive and a bit of a thank you to everyone who is a member of the association for th their support. We figured that this being the 50th anniversary, it's a significant year. And uh, to say thank you to you and to commemorate the event, we thought it would be a nice nice thing to do so uh, I've got a couple of samples over there if you want to have a look at those uh, they'll also be available to purchase uh, separately if if, uh, if people do want to purchase them to give to other friends Christmas is not far away oh, sort of is anyway um, now what we did uh, as I mentioned before the people up at Can uh, Canberra um, are doing their uh, event um, commemorating the 50th and they're all 80 year old guys, mainly guys, women as well, uh, and they're running this thing. Um, so what we've done as an association to sort of show our appreciation for the work they did back 50 years ago and to sort of make a contribution to their event because they're basically running it on the smell of an oily rag and they need to get sales and get the merchandise and the seats done to cover their costs. They've sunk in significant amount of money. We at, at the association you, as the association members, have donated uh, 20 of these commemorative cups which they're selling uh, to make some money. So um, they're very uh, thankful for that. In fact, John Sarkassian, who's the uh, chair, chairperson of the committee, wrote this uh, email back to us and expressed his thanks to us. So we figured it was a nice, a nice way of supporting them and, and um, helping them out. So look forward to I think a few people here, a couple of people here are going up to that event. So we'll look forward to a first-hand report once they get back. Um, on that line as well, we've basically, we've done a little shop, the Space Association shop. If you want some seats, there's a couple of seats heavy. You can turn around and take a seat down here or move them around to the edge of the tables. Welcome. That's it. Grab the seat and you can turn around or you can Go on the end, whatever you'd like to do. So this shop uh, has a range of products. Um, and you can look as glamorous as Shane, or even more glamorous. Probably more glamorous, but anyway. Um, uh, we've basically got a cap, a cup, a jacket, and a hoodie, a uh, t-shirt and a hoodie. So you can go there. The URL is, is, is on the screen. 
Uh, I'm not sure whether we're linking our, off our website to that yet, have we, Mike? We got a link to that? No, no. Um, but uh, yeah, so just a way of making a little bit of cash to help us meet the uh, meet the cost that we've got. Shirts there uh, on there, thirty-seven, well, thirty-eight dollars. We're selling them here for thirty because that's a third-party company. Um, so there you go. Um, so that's uh, kind of our wrap up of the business there's a lot more that we could be talking about once again the formula is the fourth monday of the month apart from december next meeting will be july 22 we'll all be completely exhausted with apollo 11 having had it just the 21st the day before but uh we'll have a, a good meeting no doubt um and once again um we do run on our memberships that's primarily ending our income uh, and that's how we keep all of our things going as you may or may not know we obviously run these meetings which you're currently at but we also do run a weekly radio station radio show Andrew Rennie is the driver of that and we have special events and special uh, things that we do as well so your membership is very available to us and we appreciate that all right so how am I doing on my time pretty bad okay so we're gonna go on to my next little presentation I'm not gonna muck around too much standby caller um, as people may be aware, we've, uh, we've been running this monthly update. So what it is, is I'll whiz through these slides. 50 years later, um, the puts the moon, the countdown to Apollo 11. So but what I've been doing is, is doing an update of what was happening in the program 50 years ago each month. So obviously this month is June 69, and next month will be the big month. Um, so these focus, me, uh, these uh, episodes have been basically around the missions, but also in between we've had focus uh, presentations on different aspects of the program. By the way, if you guys want to eat have dinner, you can go ahead and order up there. They'll come up and take your orders and stuff like that. Uh, they'll bring them up. Just give you a number and bring it up. Um, so tonight... Uh, okay, so what we have to do is transport ourselves in time. This is a very traumatic process. We do it every month. So this is our 29 p.m. And this is 1969. Got his pencil, no computer, lots Space of paper. Pen. Space pen. Yes, it, it's, it works in zero gravity. That, I'll give you that. That's it. So look, I'm not going to, I've got to have to zip through these pretty quickly. I would like to try and do a little bit of a, um, a, a scenario of what's going on in 69. So this is... Um, this gentleman, Antonio Sakaris, uh, 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 from Cuba, basically stowed on board this DC-8 in the car in the landing gear, um, and uh, he made it over the Atlantic Ocean. So, uh, yeah, although I, I think he had, had a colleague with him, and um, he believe we believe he fell out. So, 69. Um, this is interesting. The first authenticated uh, case of falling debris, calling damage on Earth, Japanese freighter ship. Uh, and the Tupolev TU-144 uh, made its first um, civilian airliner to be test flown faster than the speed of sound. And uh, following a meeting at Midway Island, US President Nixon and South Vietnamese President Yu Yen Vien uh, announced 25,000 American troops would be withdrawn. You'll remember that Nixon just got elected last year and uh, got inaugurated. So they'll be coming out by the September. Um, June 10, my birthday, uh, further work of the Manned Orbiting Laboratory uh, was halted on the orders of Nixon. Um, 23rd, the Soviet Union and 120 people were killed in the civilian airliner flew into the path of a faster moving uh, transport. 23rd of June, six bystanders on a busy Miami street were killed uh, when a Dominican Air Airlines flight crashed shortly after takeoff. 29th, the Malgram. This is interesting for those people who are interested in technology. The Malgram uh, was first tested in a joint venture between Western Union and the US Post Office. So I guess this is like a telegram, fax, whatever. Who remembers Malgrams? Yeah. Uh, in Australia, wasn't too much happening. 74 US men were killed when the destroyer the Frank E. Evans was accidentally rammed and sliced in two by an Australian uh, aircraft carrier. The subsequent investigation um, 
found that uh, 30, June 31st, the Melbourne had come within 50 feet of colliding with another American ship, the Larson. So I don't know what was going on out there. June 19, the Commonwealth Conciliation and Arbitration Commission rules that equal pay for women doing the same work as men must be phased out by 1972. How do we feel about that, ladies? Yeah, okay. Yeah, rock on, 72. <laughs> <laughs> All right, very important, we have to find out what was happening with the Beatles in 1969. Um, and the penultimate day of their second bed-in for peace, John Lennon and Yoko Ono recorded the anthemic Give Peace a Chance in room 1742 in Montreal. Um, top 10, back in June of, uh, of, this, of 69, Get Back and Don't Let Me Down was the Beatles on top, Hair, The Real Thing, The Real Thing. Awesome, awesome. I think I've still got the single at home somewhere. Uh, um, 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 um. All right, so let's have a look at what was happening in the space world. Apollo in 69, June 69. Um, uh, I'm going to have to whiz through these a little bit quickly because I'm not going to read every line of it. Basically, they approved the um, site selection for Apollo 12. Uh, they're going to go and try and land near one of the surveyors. June 9, uh, they're well on, uh, on schedule in, uh, for a July 16 launch date. Um, landing site mosaics were delivered to the flight crew training area. There was um, June 3rd, the crews of Apollo 10 and 11 were set down for a debriefing. You see John Young there with his cigar. Uh, June the 3rd, the Apollo program change control board assigned solar wind composite experiment to the first moon landing. Early engineering evaluation of Apollo 10 launch vehicle indicated that major flight objectives were accomplished, but there were a few issues. Performance of the Saturn V was satisfactory, but they had some problems with uh, pump performance and a few other bits and pieces, and low frequency lateral vibration and oscillations. So that was stuff they had to work, work on. June 10, once again my birthday, the Apollo 11 crew had to walk around the Saturn V. Man, imagine that, eh? Gonna be jumping on that thing. Um, then the, later on they went up and had a poke around in the command module, make sure it was all good. Oops. I see Mike Collins got his enthusiastic thumb up there, he's happy with his, with his spacecraft, they all look pretty pleased to be going. Um, June 11th, <coughs> Task Force for Hardware Development. Um, I'm going to whiz through this uh, 50 proposals for lunar orbital experiments. 13th, um, based on the excellent results of the Color TV, uh, of the Color TV on 10, they're going to they're uh, uh, approve a plan to carry a Color TV on Apollo 11 in the command module. Um, you'll remember last year we had Neil um, bugging out of his um, lunar landing training vehicle. Well, he went back and made his first flight on June the 15th. That's quite a long time, isn't it, uh, on, on that. Um, Three days, he completed eight flights with the vehicle for a total of uh, 40 minutes and 14 seconds. Eight flights, so he made 14 takeoffs and landings. Um, now, I, th I thought you'd be interested just to have a quick look at a little bit of video of that because we sort of see pictures, but we don't really ever see much in the way of video. So I've got about five minutes of video. I just thought you'd be interested to have a look at this. This is Simon Bob. Way. Narrator. There's a fire engine. <coughs> Probably, yeah. I think it was Ellington Air Force Base near Houston, I think. I mean, the only video we normally see is when he's punching out of this thing, but this is actually, he's flying it, having a successful flight. But it's a pretty precarious device, you've got to admit, I tell you. It's like, wow. I bet you Neil was having the time of his life up there, though.
So there's three of these built, and two of them crashed. There's one left, and it's hanging up on the roof in Houston, if everyone, anyone gets to Houston. The instrumentation. I'm sure he had altitude controls and things like that, but it would have been. I think the con controls were made to simulate the, the functions, but yeah. I mean, I think it was more about the dynamics of lateral and vertical movements and stuff like that. So basically he's got a jet engine pointing vertically down and he's, by thrusting that he gets his up and down motion, etc. I mean he's got the thrusters, the lateral movement and that type of thing. Just in the interest of time, I might have to whiz through that a bit. Sorry about that. If I can. Any land you can walk away on from is a good one, yeah? We get to use the mine again, that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so then he had a bit of a chat to the press. Unfortunately, it's once again, it's silent. Okay, so getting back to, uh, back to uh, Houston, uh, back to, actually back to KC. Um, the base here at uh, Kennedy Space Center on the 16th of uh, June, there were doing this um, analog training um, at uh, Kennedy Space Centre there. So you can see he's got this um, lanyard here, which is how he gets the camera down. Instructions by the ground crew. Near with the camera. Buzz looks like he's deploying the solar wind experiment. In the simulator, 1G simulator, the controls of that. Here's Mike in the lunar module. Basically, if you read anything about that, these uh, 1G simulators were basically side by side, so that each each crew member would go to their station and they'd work together along with mission control and run through a whole mission or section to the mission. That's not a real hatch, by the way. So on the, on the 18th, they went through um, all of the experience package and uh, basically the data plans for the procedures for the facilities. Uh, 23rd, preparation for the manned lunar landing continued. Uh, and basically, um, countdown was uh, scheduled to begin on the 27th. Once again, doing more uh, equipment che uh, checks. I suspect that these might be the actual flight suits now where they're getting closer to... Uh, to the mission, uh, they need to get into those suits, make sure they fit and comfortable and all work together. So obviously, once they're out in space on the mission, they're not going to have all these technicians hanging around, so they have to help each other, work with each other, get the equipment working, see how it all works, etc. Over an assist Armstrong, that's a rare event. Yeah. If you listen to the mission, Aldrin was excellent through the whole mission. Very, very supportive and I'll professional. Um, so on the 15th, they reported uh, to headquarters and the summary indicated that they completed 70% of their tr briefing and reviews. I'll go, I won't read it all. Overall, 92% of the training program had been completed by the 27th of June, so they were well on their way. 27th, once again, um, decision was reached on who would be the first 
to step onto the moon, reported by the Apollo Spacecraft Program Office by George Lowe. Sometime during the middle of the night, I had a call from Associated Press informing me that there had been a story that Neil Armstrong had pulled rank on Buzz Aldrin to be the first man on the surface of the moon. They wanted to know whether it was true and how the decision was reached. To the best of my recollection, I gave the following information. A, there had been many informal plans developed during the past several years concerning the lunar timeline. These probably included all combinations of one man out versus two men out, who gets out first, etc. There was only one approved plan and that was established two to four weeks prior to the public announcement of this planning. I believe that was in April of 69. The basic decision was made by the Configuration Control Board and was based on recommendations by Flight Crew Operations Directorate. I'm sure that Armstrong had made an input to the recommendation, but he by no means had the final say. The CCB decision was final. And that's the official NASA history. All right, um, pre-launch EVA. I thought we've all seen pictures of them walking around with their spacesuits on the moon, fuzzy. Seen still pictures of them walking around training. I thought you'd be interested to see how these training goes uh, in with the actual suit. So this is silent once again, but just to get a concept and understanding of how cumbersome these suits are, or were, and how much hard work it must have been doing that training in 1G. And this is interesting, this is his, a contingency sample collector. You see it pops out of his pocket, he pulls a lanyard or a string, and it firms up and becomes a rod, and then uh, he go ahead and goes ahead and grabs a, a sample. But just have a look when they're walking around and moving and, and things, how, how much hard work it would have been. This is the contingency sample. Basically, Neil was asked to take a sample pretty quickly once he got out there in case something went wrong and they had to scramble back in. They wouldn't want to get back to the earth without having at least a handful of dirt. So someone would have been rushed off to write some paperwork about why the thing fell off. But you can see how he had to kneel, kneel down and pick that up. It's not that easy. And watch this, how he how, how get in his pocket. the Herman Munster sort of walk. And it's interesting, in the ground train they've got CDR and LMP on the back of their backpacks, but when they got on the moon they never thought to, to identify them separately, so once they got on the, on the moon they knew, didn't know who was who. Later on they added a red stripe on the, on the legs and the sleeves of the commander just to identify them uh, between one and the other. But uh, you would have thought they would have done that on the ground. So there's that uh, lanyard we were talking about, the equipment transport lanyard. So basically the, the idea is that was actually clipped to Neil when he got out of the lunar module, going down the ladder, and then he would step back and Buzz would attach the camera and they'd bring it down um, to the surface for Neil. And they also used that lanyard to transport up the rock boxes back up to the, uh, to the lunar module itself. But uh, yeah, as I say, like just seeing them move around, it's... Uh, Quite, um, quite an, an operation.
I mean, their suits were cool, but it would have been quite physically taxing, I reckon, doing that, because these training sessions went on for three or four hours, or a couple of hours at least. So once again, no viewfinder with these cameras. You just have to basically turn around and sort of point where you want to go and take the picture. So they did really well. Just trying to look down. Looks like he's trying to take a picture of a bit of the surface or something. Michael Collins up there trying to get into it. Sorry, Mike, you've got to stay in orbit. Come on. We told you three times already. So for those who are not familiar, this this is I think they call it the modular equipment carrier or something. Basically, that there is the TV camera. So when Neil came down, he pulled a lanyard and it deployed this carrier, and the camera was was mounted on top of that carrier, which was where we got the first steps. Later on, they detached it, flipped it upside down, put it on a tripod to watch the rest of the mission of the moonwalk. That sounds right, yeah, 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 MISA. But there was another one on the other side of the, of the uh, legs which carried some experiments. I'm not sure which was which. But you can still see how, how much hard, hard work it is for them moving around. Oh, the, the suits would have been pressurised, yeah, because they've got the face plates closed, so they would have had sort of, well, fully operational backpacks. So obviously, it wouldn't have the um, same configurations as the, as the um, um, zero atmosphere, but would have had that cooling and cooling for the suit and oxygen flow and that type of thing. Uh, some training you'll see where they are connected up with hoses, which is when they would be doing other types of training and testing. But these would look like they're fully self-contained. So now you can see the camera's been removed from the stowage area and put on top of the tripod. And Neil's going to take that off and put it out. And there we go. Thanks, Neil. And this is where Al Bean on Apollo 12 pointed at the sun and bent the uh, tube out. So we've got TV from Apollo 12. And there's the solar wind experiment that Buzz is deploying. T 
Tina Stag, our Tasmania correspondent, has piped in. It's modular equipment stowage assembly. Just a couple more minutes if people are interested to watch this. I just find it fascinating. <laughs> Space geek. Guilty. So for those of you online, this is where they actually filmed the moonwalk. This is how they faked it. Send your letters and cards in later. So there's uh, one of the rock boxes. Actually, interesting thing about the rock box, um, it was manufactured by, I can't remember the name, but the company that manufactured the original mock rock boxes have now released a set of luggage styled on it. <laughs> it's like 600 bucks for a suitcase, but gee, I'd like one. <laughs> there's so much stuff coming out for Pole 11, it's crazy. 50. Uh, we might have to move on because time is against us. Um, oh, they, they, there was one seg session where they did a full run through with all the top brass from NASA, Von Braun, everybody sitting there taking notes, watching, and that was when they finally got the approval. And you can see carrying the. Uh, when the experiment package it's Buzz taking off. There's a picture, famous picture of him on the moon walking off into the distance to deploy that with Neil taking the picture there. And I think this shows you the deploy. I didn't know, so I had to run out of time. Uh, this is an interesting little thing popped up. Uh, Mike Collins posted this on Facebook and Twitter on the 14th. Throwback to the crew, found this at the bottom of a box. I don't think it was ever used by NASA. So there's a famous set of portraits, one of which I think we showed before. This is one that was never used, and that's quite a nice picture. And I, I like it, the fact that uh, Neil's got his hand on Buzz's shoulder. Yeah. It's nice. And they've all got nice smiles on their face, too. That's good. All right, so now we have to come back to 2019. This is Richard, back in 69. Now, who can tell me who this is? Well, you can tell who the tattoo is, right? Any clues? This is Roger Stone, one of Donald Trump's key advisors up until he got thrown in jail, or I think he's at court now. Um, he's got this tattoo in the middle of his back. So there you go, 2019. <laughs> Happy days. All right, so uh, thank you for this. So now we're getting into the, the pointy end of this. Uh, next month, July, it's Apollo 11. They've just bought a press kit, kit and a Boeing and all the other companies have um, produce some things. So we'll see you at the July 22nd meeting. And that's my segment done. Uh, it's Hive now, isn't it? Or is it Andrew? Andrew. Ash, is, where's um, Andrew's on the desktop? Right, greetings everyone. All right, uh, try and stand over here a bit more. Sorry? Stand over here a bit more and here's the microphone. Yep, I will. That microphone is going to Yep, greetings. Uh, okay, as um, I'm going to be talking about how the decision to land on the moon and how to land on the moon was made, I do have a couple of advisories for you. And 
The history of the Apollo project can be divided into two parts. Uh, before 1962, June the 7th, and after that to date. Now, I'll explain why later. My story this evening is related to the struggle between three concepts of how to get to the moon. But first, some precursor ideas. Humans had long thought of travel to the moon, but it only became a realistic proposition after the Second World War. But it was never going to happen without public understanding and support. To that end, Werner von Braun and others began a long campaign to drum up that support. Part of that campaign were a series of articles and magazines such as Colliers in 1952. Remember, this was five and a half years before Sputnik. The plan was to assemble the lunar fleet in Earth orbit. Some plans called for a huge space station from which lunar missions could be launched and to which they could return. Uh, this would mean the winged shuttles would not need to fly to the moon. Rockets leaving the Earth would be huge. Willie Lay supported von Braun's vision. Here we see a well-populated space station that would make Jim Bridenstine drool. You can judge the size of the lunar lander from the size of the spacewalking astronauts. The caption to this cover reads, and I quote, A historic moment, man's first landing on the moon. The lunar rocket ship is about to touch down. Its motors are being turned off and the shock absorbing central landing leg, visible inside the rocket flames, is just above the moon's surface. The caption continues, This view with the distant Earth in the background was painted by artist Chesley Bonestell from the perspective of a man standing on the lunar north pole. With the space station built, assembly of the lunar fleet could begin. There would be cargo ship, or a cargo ship and a passenger ship. Because these craft will not start land on Earth, there is no need to carry heat shields to the moon. I can count 20 men and no woman on the lunar spaceship. Outdoing Elon Musk, three lunar landers make simultaneous descents to the moon. Once down on the moon, the astronauts get busy with Caterpillar track rovers. The first day on the moon would be six weeks. The article says that the landing legs are jettisoned soon after takeoff to save weight. Von Braun's grandiose visions even extended to fleets of spaceships to Mars. Since we all know the end result, <coughs> since we all know the end result of the Apollo mission mode controversy, a bit of timeline history won't give any spoilers. 1957, October the 4th, in the Soviet Union, Korolev launches Sputnik 1, the first artificial satellite. One year later, October the 1st, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration is formed. A week later, Project Mercury is officially established. Within days, Keith Glennon established a space task group at Langley under Robert Gilruth to work on Project Mercury. This was a one-man spacecraft. Rosen and Swink began to sketch out a possible lunar mission. Already in 1959, the idea of a landing stage and an ascent stage was clearly set out. The lunar ascent rocket would be detached from the command module before atmospheric entry. At the same time, the US Army was exploring lunar landing concepts. On 1959, October the 21st, NASA formally acquired the Army's Saturn project. Now this action followed much argument. The Army reluctantly acquiesced for two main reasons. Firstly, to prevent the Air Force taking over the Von Braun team. Secondly, because the Saturn booster had its primary place in space exploration and not in the Army missile program. 
During 1960, NASA was preparing to implement its long-range plan beyond Project Mercury. This included a manned circumlunar mission that was, as yet, unnamed. Then, in July, a NASA headquarters group recommended that NASA plan a lunar landing to be made sometime after 1970. On 1960, July the 28th, NASA's Director of Space Flight Programs, Abe Silverstein, announced that the NASA Circum, sorry, the NASA Manned Circumlander, Circumlunar Mission uh, project would be named Apollo. Circumlunar means you just go around the moon and you don't, uh, you don't, um, you don't circle the moon, uh, and you come right back to Earth. You don't land on the moon. The mission was based on a proposal by General Electric. Now, General Electric's proposed spacecraft is being shown off here by James Webb and George Lowe. As related in the official NASA history book by Helen Wells, Susan Whiteley, and Carrie, Carrie Giannis, the name Apollo had an appeal for a number of reasons. Now, this is a fire-damaged bust of Apollo from Delphi, and in retrospect, it's quite appropriate in the light of the survival of the Apollo project after the Apollo 1 fire. Apollo was the Greek god of poetry, music, prophecy and archery, as depicted in this carving from Cathara. Here is another statue of Apollo, this one a Roman copy of a Greek original. The naming was following the precedent of using mythology set by Project Mercury. That detail is set out in the NASA history. On 1960, September the 8th, President Eisenhower visited the Redstone Arsenal, escorted by Von Braun. Late that year, President Eisenhower's Science Advisory Committee reports that a manned lunar landing was feasible but that it would cost between 26 and 38 billion dollars. But Eisenhower refused to approve any manned program beyond Mercury. In 1960, NASA held a design competition for a lunar craft. This was the Martin submission. It was to be a direct ascent mission with a lifting body crew compartment to allow a controllable re-entry back to Earth. By 1961, Rector of General Dynamics was showing a modified version of its Apollo circumlunar spacecraft. It is interesting to note that Apollo 13 did eventually fulfill the original plan for Apollo to make a circumlunar mission. In 1961 February, George Lowe's committee says, and I quote, the manned lunar landing mission could be accomplished during the decade at a cost of $7 billion through fiscal year 1969. Early in the Kennedy administration, Lyndon Johnson takes control of the Space Council and persuades James Webb to head NASA and talks Kennedy into emphasizing space. 1969, uh, sorry, 61, May the 25th, Kennedy gave a speech to Congress that was to change the course of history. The Apollo project changed from a circumlunar one to a landing one. The problem was no one at NASA or elsewhere had any idea how to do it, much less before the decade is out which everyone assumed was the end of 1969, not 1970. That, of course, depends on how you count decades. Um, if you take the view that uh, the first decade of the current era only had nine years, then it was 1969. Late in 1961, contracts for major Apollo program elements were signed before the lunar landing mode had been decided. Even so, three main Apollo mission types were planned. One thing was obvious, there would now be several variants of the Apollo spaceship. At the end of 1961, plans to develop the Saturn C3 and C4 were cancelled, constraining the possible mission modes of getting to the moon. 
This cancellation also reduced the chances of constructing von Braun's cherished space station. From 1961 through to mid-62, there were vigorous discussions and arguments about the mission mode for Apollo. In 1961 December, NASA Associate Administrator Robert Siemens announced the Gemini project. Its aim was to develop the technique of rendezvous in space. Now the original concept had been called Mercury Mark II. Uh, 1962, um, January, we've got Von Braun making a lecture tour of Australia. One engagement was at Sydney University, where he answered student questions. Von Braun formally accepted the Lunar Orbit Rendezvous by concluding a long meeting with the proponents of the various mission modes by saying, Well, gentlemen, I have listened to the arguments. I'm proud of the work you have done. Now, I'll tell you the position of the center, by which he meant the Marshall Space Flight Center. The decision on mission mode was made on the grounds that were as much political as technical. I'll return to that assertion. The decision to use the Lunar Orbit Rendezvous mission mode for Apollo was announced. In 1962, September 11th, President Kennedy toured the Redstone Arsenal guided by Von Braun. Von Braun even got to ride in the presidential limousine during the royal tour. Vice President Johnson was there as well. Now reporters, expecting that this was to be a simple photo opportunity, were astonished to hear a vigorous discussion on the Apollo mission mode. Von Braun was briefing the President on the Lunar Rendezvous mission when Jerome Weisner interrupted Von Braun by saying, No, that's no good. And Webb immediately defended Von Braun and Lunar Orbit Rendezvous. The adversaries engaged in a heated exchange until the President stopped them, stating that the matter was still subject to final review. Not close enough to hear exactly what was said, the press nevertheless heard enough to report there were still serious disputes about how to get to the moon. 1962, October, James Webb visits the White House and, and he tells Kennedy that it was his firm intention to let the Lunar Excursion Module contract to Grumman Aviation. Either that, or Kennedy might like to consider accepting his resignation as administrator. The Grumman Company was awarded the contract for designing and producing the Lunar Excursion Module. This changes the mission mode decision from tentative to confirmed. In 1963, um, President Kennedy ag again visited the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, this time with Von Braun, and inspected the Saturn I rocket that was being prepared for the Apollo Saturn V mission, which was placed into orbit on 1964, January the 29th. In 1966 June, the name Lunar Excursion Module was changed to Lunar Module. Some writers have incorrectly said that this was because the word excursion sounded frivolous, as in an excursion to the beach. Actually, it was because the word implied mobility on the moon, and this vehicle did not have that capability. From 1962 through to 1969, the design of the Grumman Lunar Module evolved over time. Shown here are the 1962, the 1963, the 1965 and the 1969 designs. Now the story of these changes is a tale for another day. Sorry, haven't got time tonight. Well, we then come to the famous date. Apollo 11 lands on the moon. Now do you remember that seesaw? 
Why was 1962 July the tipping point? It had long been recognised that Von Braun's grandiose plans as set out in Collier's magazine were not possible. This is a book I bought for 15 shillings in 1961. Little did I know then that the first human lander on the moon uh, would be named Eagle. In it, there is, an, there is an alternative way to land on the moon, as proposed by the Convair Company. Reminding us of the way that the Curiosity rover landed on Mars in 2012, the Convair craft would be lowered on strings. Others were proposing a mini Von Braun type vehicle that could be, uh, well, that could transport lots of cargo to the moon and then blast off directly back to Earth. In 1961, employees at Langley, which was where the Mercury project was run from, proposed sending a modified Mercury craft to the moon. Not only that, they also planned to then get the astronaut to pilot this contraption down to the moon. In 1961 November, Harris Shoaff of the Space Task Group Engineering Division proposed this lunar lander, which was to be used with an advanced version of the Mercury spacecraft. One of the Langley group was, Jamat, was John Hobart. Hobalt's original proposals were unrealistic. He calculated a mass of 6,800 kilograms for a pressurized lunar module and 1,140 kilograms for an open platform. The uh, joke went around that the astronaut should wrap an aviator's silk scarf around his neck. Well, there are five main ways to land on the moon and return to Earth. Only two of these were under serious consideration in 1961. Blast off the Earth directly to the Moon, land, explore and blast off with enough energy to come directly back to Earth. The rocket men at Huntsville liked this, bigger rockets for them to build. I seem to have lost my place here, but uh, let's see. Direct ascent would require the huge Nova rocket. This would have a mass of 5,900 tons and a liftoff thrust of 180 meganewtons, although I have seen other estimates of the mass and thrust. For comparison, the Atlas was the largest rocket then available with a thrust of 1.6 meganewtons and the later Saturn V used 33.4 meganewtons to lift 2,767 tons. Now this uh, method was seen as having the advantage of simplicity. Disadvantage was the need to ramp up thrust by two orders of magnitude. Huge cost. No chance to check out the spacecraft after launch because you are already on your way. Now it could have been achieved if the Saturn V was hydrogen fueled on all stages and the crew was only two people. But hydrogen was, in 1961, an unproven technology. A heavy landing and return vehicle might break through the lunar crust or sink deeply into the lunar dust. The exact nature of the lunar surface was unknown until Lunar 9 and Surveyor 1 landed in 1966. A tall stack might land on an uneven surface and topple over. And I'm reminded uh, that my aunt was telling me uh, in the mid-1960s that they couldn't land on the moon because there was no gantry to hold the rocket up on the moon. So it would fall over. The uh, crew, lying on their backs, 
some 60 meters above the tail, would have a lack of visibility when landing. Nova would take 10 years longer to develop than the Saturn V. There was another mode that had its advocates. Build the entire moon craft in Earth orbit by sending it up in pieces on smaller rockets. Then fly directly to the moon as in the direct ascent plan. The precise timing of multiple launches would be needed to achieve rendezvous. And remember that neither manned nor unmanned rendezvous had been achieved in 1961. This method had all the disadvantages of the direct method in that the lunar landing vehicle would still be as ponderous. The Earth orbit rendezvous method could conceivably use lots of Saturn C1s or the Saturn C5 then being planned. Now, in this drawing, John Hobolt shows that 10 Saturn I launches would be required. Another advantage, of course, there's no need to build the Nova. A space station in Earth orbit would be one spin-off of this method. And this was the favourite of Von Braun, a long-time advocate of space stations. The problem was still how to bring the payload mass down so that it could still be flown on the Saturn C5, so the cost was still very high. Several variants of the Earth orbit rendezvous method were proposed. One favourite was to launch one or more unmanned tanker rockets to Earth, Earth orbit, then launch a manned Apollo to rendezvous and replenish its fuel before setting course for the moon. Unfortunately, cryogenic propellants are tricky to store and pump on Earth. But what about in the weightless vacuum? Question mark. This mission mode would need two Saturn C5 launches for each mission. Another rendezvous mode was called Lunar Surface Rendezvous. Land a cache of fuel and supplies on the moon with an unmanned rocket to await arrival of the manned space ship. The Nova would not be required as mission could be accomplished with two Saturn Vs. If the payload of the unmanned rocket were damaged, there would be no return ticket for the astronaut. This damage might not be apparent until the crew arrived on the moon. Astronauts would spend much of their time on the moon d doing their refueling, with very little time left for geology or other science. If liquid oxygen were used, it would have a limited lifetime. If the astronauts landed too far off target, they would be unable to reach their supply base and refuel. Now remember, Apollo 11 overshot its target by 7 kilometres. Piers Brizoni summed up the situation thus, and I quote, As 1961 drew to a close, the problems of the direct ascent approach had become painfully obvious. The upper stage of the lunar rocket, about the mass and length of a Navy destroyer, would have to land on the moon's stern first without toppling over, and then take off again without the benefit of a launch gantry and to ground crew. It was also a challenge to work out how the astronaut sitting on top of this monster were supposed to pilot it safely to a touchdown when they couldn't see the moon through their windows. They'd have to ease the ship down using rear pointing TV cameras or some such. Brizoni continues, when over-optimistic sketches emerged showing the rocket landing on its side on skids, that signalled the end of the ball game for direct ascent. Bisoni adds that, and I quote, Von Braun and his team at Marshall preferred Earth orbit rendezvous, not just because it seemed safer, but because it also guaranteed them a greater technical role in the lunar voyage itself rather than just blasting hardware away from Earth. 
1916, a Russian mechanic named Yuri Kondratyuk was considering how to travel to the moon. He wrote, the entire spacecraft need not land. He explained this in a self-published book in 1929. Unaware of Conrad York's work, Dr. John Hobolt was pondering the problem. He was a relatively obscure engineer working under Gilruth at Langley Field. His regular work was in aerodynamics research. Already his one-man concept had been laughed out of court, so many regarded him as a joke. However, he began to study orbital rendezvous techniques. Then the idea struck him. Did Columbus have to drive his vessel up onto the beach in order to set a man ashore in the New World, when a long boat was ample for the purpose? He scribbled rough but workably accurate estimates of mass factors on an envelope. He later refined the calculations and typed them up for a report. He had discovered the mass at launch could be cut approximately in half. Ergo, a single Saturn V would suffice for each mission. Hobart began a long campaign to proselytize his ideas. He was able to calculate the probabilities of mission success for each of the mission modes. Naysayers included von Braun, Max Fage, and Kennedy's powerful advisor, Jerome Wisner. Hobart wrote to NASA Associate Administrator Robert Siemens in 1961, May the 19th, outlining his concerns. Most of that letter had to do with launch vehicles, but it also mentioned lunar orbit rendezvous. Hobart received a brief note of acknowledgement from Siemens, but no action ensued. Just days after Kennedy's speech to Congress, Hobart drew this sketch, which is now known as the to the moon or bust drawing. In it, Hobart shows that it would take 10 Saturn I launches to loft into its orbit the components for a manned lunar landing. In this concept, two one-man lunar landers would be flown on the same mission. In another drawing, Hobart considers two one-man landers launched by the later cancelled Saturn C3 rocket. In the following months, Hobart prepared a detailed report setting out the rationale for lunar orbit rendezvous supported by detailed calculations. This was delivered to NASA in 1961, October the 31st. He continued his crusade to gather converts. 1961, November the 15th, Hobart again breached protocol by writing directly to Webb's associate administrator, Robert Siemens. Now, Hobart felt he had to defend himself from accusations that he was a crank. You notice the, uh, the comment there. Now, it's not clear whether Hobart included a full copy of his October the 31st report with his letter, but it is clear that parts of it at least were attached. In his 1971 book, Earthbound Astronauts, Bernie, Bernie Lay wrote, Siemens was sufficiently impressed and disturbed by Hobart's outburst to bucket onto his director of manned spaceflight Brainerd Holmes, not perfunctorily, but with a request for serious evaluation. Holmes promptly dispatched the newly appointed deputy, Joseph Shea, to Langley. By the time Shea left in early 1962, Hobart was in the end zone for a touchdown, cheered on by supporters who now numbered nearly everyone in NASA except Von Braun. Back in uh, Washington, 
So, well, as Lay tells it in this book, uh, and I quote, Back in Washington, Joe Shea's favorable report on LOR was followed by several months of computer analysis on a national scale. By the end of 1962 June, mountains of data from, com from the computers had uh, carried the day for the bug approach. Gil Ruth presented his conclusions in 1962 July in, t in Huntsville to Von Braun. There had been a long-standing antagonism between Von Braun's rocket-oriented camp at Huntsville and Gil Ruth's pilot and aviation-oriented camp at Houston. During 1962, Joseph Shea had tried to get the Manned Spacecraft Center and the Marshall Space Flight Center to work together. According to Michael Newfield, Max Fage and the Manned Spacecraft Center told Shea to get lost. Newfield says, J was never able to satisfactorily solve the problem of how to land the big Earth orbit rendezvous vehicle on the moon. Originally, the lander was 27 meters long. J proposed a lunar crasher stage. This would be a module under the Apollo Command Service module that would contain enough propellant to slow the spacecraft into lunar orbit, then lower it from lunar orbit down to near the surface before being jettisoned in a low altitude separation. With astronauts lying on their backs, visibility was still a problem. The basic concept for lunar orbit rendezvous was as follows. Fly a two-part spacecraft on a Saturn C5 to Earth orbit. Check it out. Punch out to the moon. Go into lunar orbit. Separate the lunar excursion module and land it on the moon whilst the main craft remains in lunar orbit. Then the ascent stage lifts off to lunar orbit, rendezvous and dock with the command module. Then abandon the lunar excursion module in orbit. Then punch out of lunar orbit in the main craft and fly directly back to Earth. Advantages. It can be achieved with just one Saturn C5 launch. Half the payload mass is required than Earth orbit rendezvous. Multiple chances to check out the spacecraft and to chicken out. The cost of 10 to 15 percent less than Earth orbit rendezvous mode. No need to carry Earth entry heat shield down to and back up from the moon. But there are some disadvantages. Rendezvous in Earth orbit, let alone lunar orbit, had not yet been demonstrated. Now, von Braun's, uh, uh, well, with von Braun's objections withdrawn, the Fage uh, was outmaneuvered and a press conference was organised for 1962. July 11 to announce the decision to tentatively use the lunar orbit rendezvous mission mode for Apollo. A 32-page report on this press conference was later published by NASA. This public announcement did not silence the critics. At the end of 1962 July, the President's Science Advisory Panel struck back. Weisner issued a report criticising LOR as, and I quote, extremely ingenious but highly specialised and isolated development. As related in the official NASA history, Managing Apollo in the sorry, managing NASA in the Apollo era. The report argued, and I quote, if a two-man crew is adequate for the most difficult part of the LOR mission, then it cannot be persuasively argued that three men must be landed in other modes. The panel preferred EOR, 
is the orbit rendezvous because it seemed to offer a greater margin of safety. The NASA history notes that, and I quote, the decision was made on grounds that were as much political as technical. I promise to come back to that point. Now by this NASA historian Arnold Levine means that the LOR idea came out of Langley and as such was seen to be neutral between Houston and the Huntsville camps. As a result, the mission mode well, sorry, start again. As a result of the mission mode decision, the design of the Apollo project evolved. So too did the concepts for the lunar lander. The lander could now be much smaller than required for the Earth orbit rendezvous method. Well, von Braun never got the Saturn C3 or C4, but had to be consoled with the Saturn C5. Nor did he get his cherished Nova. Nor did his hopes to continue flying reusable Saturn boosters eventuate. It was up to South African Elon Musk to bring the concept of reusable rockets to fruition. Grumman, after some difficulties and design changes, did succeed at building the two-man lunar module. Hobart was eventually recognised as the father of lunar orbit rendezvous and the one who changed the course of the Apollo project. Note, as you see from the whiteboard there, or the blackboard I should say, uh, he initially called the lander the LEV, the Lunar Excursion Vehicle. Writing in 1971, Bernie Lay said, Most experts I consulted now believe that the United States might still today be far from reaching the Apollo goal if any of the lunar orbit rendezvous alternatives had been chosen. When Life magazine was preparing an article on the lunar orbit rendezvous mode, they wanted to use this picture on the cover. NASA dissuaded them. At the urging of Neil Armstrong, Yuri Kondratyuk was eventually recognised in his own country with the result of coins, stamps and statues honouring him. Today the lessons of the 1960s are heeded in lunar mission planning. In the same way that John Hobolt analyzed mission modes, today's planners are using his techniques. Both Chang'e 5 and Chang'e 6 will use lunar orbit rendezvous to return lunar samples. The Soviet lunar, sorry, the Soviet lunar probes use direct ascent from the lunar surface. As for winged spacecraft, well, we did get the space shuttle. It helped to build a sort of space station. The uh, full story of the Apollo mode decision is a bit like a maze. Unlike garden mazes, where there is only one solution, this maze has many equally valid pathways of which I have told but one. I would encourage you to enter this maze and find your own preferred path through it. Or to explore the numerous, though fascinating, dead ends. And there's supposed to be a movie here, but I can't get it to work. It's a, uh, a movie of the, um, the Hobart Mu Museum. And I was going to play the first three minutes of a six and a half minute movie. But no, it won't play Peter. No, it's, it disappeared. I know you. I added the, the movie to this PowerPoint presentation, and Peter added it again, and it still doesn't work. Okay. So anyway, there's a museum dedicated to John Hobart, and uh, I encourage you to explore it. Okay. Thanks, Andrew. That was fascinating. Some uh, amazing. Uh, 
It's amazing stuff there and some interesting politics and engineering and all the other factors and personalities as well. So, excellent. Um, thank you so much for that. We're going to invite James Kirby up now uh, to just before we have our just before we have our break, and he's going to tell us all about rock building and flying rockets in Australia. Yes, you heard right. Um, I'll let you introduce yourself, James. I'll, uh, there we go. If you can hand me this one, that picks up the stream. Okay. Hi everyone. Um, my name's James. I'm from Hive Rocket Team, and we're based in um, RMIT University here in Victoria. Um, and I've just heard that Angelo gave us a bit of a shout out last week, so thank you very much for that, Angelo. What I'd like to do tonight is take you on a on a bit of a short story. Um, about the, the journey that we went on for the last 12 months um, in terms of building rockets um, and, and sort of where it's taken us now. So we're a team out of RMIT. Um, we started off with about 30 students um, and over the 12 months we had about 70 students um, go through the team in some way. Even before, before it started, uh, in 2017, we had a club at RMIT where we were working quite a lot with small model rockets. Um, and this is quite a common story for people who, are, who move on to these, these amateur rocketry um, sort of side of things. So you can see some of the images here of some of the little baby ones that we were building for, for many years beforehand. Um, something special happened in April last year, and that is that the Australian Youth Aerospace Association um, took some of these competitions that were happening in, in the US and Europe, um, these, these rocket competitions, um, and they brought it to Australia. And they started um, something called the Australian Universities Rocket Competition. And that really gave us and many other universities in the area the drive to, to sort of step out of this very small rocket area um, and, and really sort of aim for something a little bit bigger. Not as big as uh, Andrew's Saturn V. <laughs> So what was the competition um, that they set? Again, it was brought over from uh, similar competitions overseas, um, but looking at two challenges. One was you need to fly to a certain altitude and you need to get as close as you can to that altitude, not under, not over, but right on target. Um, and the second challenge that they gave us was that we had to launch a scientific payload. Um, and in this case, it had to be over four kilos. Um, we had the choice to do whatever we wanted to do. Uh, and the image that you see up here is actually a, a simulation that one of the uh, one of the members in the audience has, has done, a um, uh, resident scientist, um, and this was something that we launched um, just a few months ago. So the journey that we took was from having a little bit of knowledge launching these little tiny rockets, um, and the, the first big step that we took with some help, a lot of help along the way, was this one here that we called Hive. And you can see for scale um, on the left-hand side there, that's sort of how big it was. Uh, we launched it in a place called Serpentine, which is just near Bendigo, and we launched it successfully. So as part of the process, we had to step through these levels. Um, we had to get our level one, level two certifications in, in this rocketry, um, and we managed to get level one. We thought, that's, that's pretty good, that's, that's easy. We can do this. So then we went on to step two, and we launched another one which we called POX, and it didn't work quite as well. <laughs> so we'd started to add just a little bit of electronics to it, we'd started to make it a little bit more complicated, and it, it didn't go as, as we'd planned. Um, now one of the issues that we had was these levels that we had to step through. We had to step through a level one and a level two, and the rocket we were planning to launch at this competition at the end was a, was a level three. And there's no way that we were going to be able to launch that without stepping through these, these certification levels. So, so we tried again. And we launched one called Mooncake. Similar sort of size. Um, and this one sort of worked, but it landed in a tree. So we absolutely destroyed it getting it down. Um, but they were very, very kind. And the, the rocket launched properly, came down properly. So they gave us another level one certificate. So that means we had two in the team at this point. So we need to go for something a little bit bigger. We're running out of time by this point as well. So we need to get some level two certifications under our belt um, before we get to this competition. So that so we're allowed to launch in this competition. 
Um, so there was a small team of us that put everything together, or well, the whole team put everything together, a small team of us that went to Queensland, because by that time, fire season had kicked in. Couldn't launch in Victoria anymore. So we packed up all of our gear, went to Queensland, and we launched this one here called Truckee. Again, probably about the same size, so we've been sticking at about the same size all the way through. But this time, we made it tougher. It was made of carbon fibre. We put a much bigger rocket inside it, and we just managed to get that one back. <laughs> so that was our first level two certification. And uh, feeling pretty good about that, we went and launched our second one, and that didn't work quite as well. We crashed that one too, so not having a fantastic track record. Um, and that was our final practice run before the competition. So just to give you a little bit of a, a recap, this is sort of our progression, but we didn't do too well on that one, or that one, or that one. <laughs> <laughs> and that's our next one. <laughs> that's our design for our next one. Um, so we had to level two anyway. So we went full steam ahead. Um, we had everyone in the team sort of really push for that design, um, that outline that you saw just before. And this is the final days before we packed everything up and, and left to go on that trip. Um, you can see actually on the left hand side, they're the two that we took with us to Queensland um, to launch. Um, but the one on the right is the, the payload experiment that was finished, if I'm right, the day before we left. And we were still working on it while we got up there to Thunder. Um, this is packing everything up, ready to go in the bus. So the place that we had to go to was um, Thunder Down Under. So it's just into Queensland. Um, it's, it was about 18 hours drive, I think, um, maybe a little bit less. So two, two days drive from, from Melbourne. Um, so we packed up all of our gear, we still had a, or well, we had an almost finished rocket, but it still wasn't quite there, but we packed it up anyway, got, jumped in the bus and got up there. So on the first day we were scrutineered, they had a look over all of the systems that were built um, and we had really had three main parts. We had all the, the airframe, um, we had the avionics base of all of our flight computers and then we had this scientific experiment as well. Um, so you can see some of the bits and pieces here on the tables. Um, we've got a laser pointer as well, yes. So uh, here we've got some of the avionics bay that we're displaying and then we've got the payload on here as well. Um, as I mentioned, we hadn't really finished everything by the time we went up. So on day two, we were checking everything, checking everything um, and making sure that everything was working okay. We still had a couple of small problems to fix. We were still sanding our airframe down and putting stickers on on the very last day as well. On day three, this was the final chance that we had to launch for the actual competition. Um, so got everything ready to go, got it up there, and by the time the um, by the time we got up there, everyone had thought the same thing. Everyone, there was a big queue basically of, of rockets to launch um, that were, people were trying to get done by the end. So I was given the job of uh, standing there holding onto the rocket um, while we were standing in, in the queue. Once we finally were given the all clear to go and um, rack this rocket up to be able to launch it, um, we loaded it into the back of a bus because, because our rocket was probably the largest one that they were launching there at the event. They thought it was quite dangerous, so they pushed us right back about a half kilometre away. So we loaded it up in the bus, we got it to the launch rail, and we figured out that it wouldn't fit properly on the launch rail. <laughs> um, this was because we've got uh, some safety pins which, which basically go into the rocket and that's fine if you line them all up the same way but when you've got one team putting them in one way and one team putting them at 90 degrees you, you kept run into some problems. So that, that's what we did here. So this is as the first attempt at, at trying to, to line it up on there. And uh, so, so basically we uh, we had a very small team of people stick around um, to hold it there and to do all the final tests. We had everyone else run back and their job, the people who were sticking around, was to make sure everything worked okay, jump in that bus and go like hell um, to the launch pad. The, one of the issues that we had was as soon as we pulled these pins out, um, the experiment was very, very power hungry. So we had 15 minutes um, to 
complete everything basically once we pulled that pin. So it meant that we had to pull that pin, do all our communication tests, get that small team back to the launch line, launch the rocket up, um, all within 15 minutes. So we set that timer um, and we just managed to keep to that as well. So I've got a small video of the launch of the rocket and it's, it's going to sound a little strange because it's in slow motion. one it flew true it flew straight we were all super super excited um, but such a big rocket you lose it very very quickly um, we had eyes on it we we heard that there was a, an event which means that there was a small parachute a drogue which um, uh, which deployed at the top and we were watching it come down and this is a, a zoomed in photo where we can see the the small drogue at the top up here so this is this has done its job um, but this main parachute, we kept on looking and looking and it, it didn't seem to open. Um, and we were all very, very worried. We saw it come all the way down to the ground and we, we didn't know, we didn't think it had really opened. So we had the recovery team race over and, and check and see. Um, and we can see here that we're pretty excited because it looks like it's in one piece. Um, and once we figured nothing was broken, <laughs> <laughs> there were some celebrations um, over there and we had one of our team members over here he was listening for the for the beeps that the altimeter gave off to figure out exactly how high it had gone because one of those challenges as I mentioned at the start was that we hit 30,000 on the mark um, now I, I can't remember exactly but we were getting beeps pretty close to 30,000 it might have been 500 feet over over or so um, now we brought that back we got our level three certificate by, by launching that rocket. They checked over the rocket. They made sure it was all okay. It's fantastic. Um, so we were celebrating on the way back. And this is actually where we brought it back to our, our tent. That's our sort of base on the flight line. Um, and the final part that we had to do was to get the competition organizers to come over and to double check that altitude. Now, Something that was probably a little bit different for our team than the other teams is that as we were getting towards the end of this competition in the months leading up to it, our focus really changed from getting a rocket that worked to making sure we had some really valuable stuff coming from this payload. It was really the payload that, that was the make or break for our team. So one of my favorite or my absolute favorite photo from the whole thing is this. So we got this rocket back to our, our tent, our flight line, and the competition organisers were, were waiting for us to, to get this stuff ready, and we were tearing the rocket apart, trying to get this payload data back so we could see it. Um, we weren't really worried about, <laughs> about how high it had gone. Um, so this is the first look at the photos um, that were coming off the payload. Um, we lost communications. We, we were trying to get photos down, but we lost communications. Um, so this was our first look at the, at the images. Um, now here's probably about time where I tell you a little bit about the, the payload. We were, the, the team were doing something quite novel. Um, they were, they had some quite powerful magnets, some electromagnets, and they were looking at the um, ferrofluid or, or like a magnetic fluid um, in between those magnets and seeing what it was doing in microgravity. Um, so can't say too much because we're still in the process of, of getting that, that published, um, but it's, it's some quite exciting a novel work that, that came out of really a student a student rocket project. A couple more celebrations at the end. Our payload team. So please go and say hi to Nick and he, he can probably tell you a little bit more <laughs> than what I can. Um, now moving forward this this has really been the catalyst for for some movement within Australian universities um, and universities overseas as well. We had um, University of Canterbury from, from New Zealand come over and compete. Um, so this was one of our fellow competitors, UQ Space, who are, who are a really committed team. They were great guys and girls to work with. 
and they're moving on to um, competing in Spaceport America, which is the American version of this competition. Um, and I'm sure we'll see them back next year competing in the same one as well in Australia. We've got um, local team Monash HBR, um, who came, so I should say RMIT won the, the high, high altitude category, the 30,000 foot category. Um, Monash were very close on our tail all the time and had some fantastic um, workmanship and, and some uh, their science as well on board. Um, and I'm not sure who would have heard about this, but another one of our fellow competitors there at the competition was University of Sydney. Um, now they're actually the first Australian team to go over to the US. They were at Spaceport America. Um, they're over there right now actually. And it was yesterday or the day before they actually won their category um, in Spaceport America, going up to 10,000 feet and getting within three meters of their target going up three kilometers in the sky. So they've done a fantastic job all the way through. So really I wanted to leave on that note that, that this has been the catalyst for, for a lot of universities and a lot of students to, to sort of really develop these teams. Um, and I see some, some very exciting things coming from it in the future. So thank you very much. What was the uh, engine? Did you develop your own engine? What, um, what sort of? So, as part of the competition, it's a commercial off the shelf motor setup. Um, so, we used a solid propellant, uh, the same fuel they use in the um, shuttle boosters, actually. So. Anyone got any questions? What size motor? What size? So, the motor that we flew on was an O3400. Oh, got one here. Okay. Uh, so it was as close to 30,000 feet as possible. Did you use any sort of active braking or was it just based on modelling the flight for that? So for our MIT team, um, we were focused on, on really modelling that flight. But um, so, yeah, so we we're doing simulations basically to, to, try and, to, to try and get that height. And we'd ballast um, the rocket to, to try and get that. Now, another team, University of Canterbury, used active air brakes. Um, and I know that Monash has tried that now as well. So they had a quite a cool design where they had four little fins which would, which would pop out and a control system. Um, so they would um, deploy that just before they got to their 30,000 foot mark. So. Thanks, Peter. One last one. The parachute didn't look like it came out, but it, it was enough to break it so it didn't bend it. Or was it some new system you so, developed? <laughs> no, so we had, in our, in our rush to get to the competition, we had used a different system, one that we hadn't used before. Uh, it's actually a bag that you pack the parachute in, um, and I believe we didn't pack it properly, and the shroud lines got caught around the parachute as it fell out. Um, so we wrapped up our parachute basically in the, in the shroud lines. So not exactly rocket scientists. Well, that's <laughs> <important point. laughs> All right, thank you so much for that. Thank you very much. Yes, really good. So look, I am delighted to announce we are on time tonight. I can't believe it. Two minutes over. So we're going to take a 15 minute break. Stand up, stretch your legs, have a chat to somebody you haven't met before. I've got a little sign up there. We've got some of these t-shirts that we've designed for the 40th and 50th anniversary 40th anniversary of Apollo 11. They're available for sale, $30 each. Um, and come up and see me or um, have a chat. Cheers. Well done.
Which one? editions of the ESA Bulletin, which is no longer being published. So if you're interested, um, come up and get yourself one. How are we going, Ashley? Ready to go. Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. And uh, once again, <laughs> thank you. You wear it well. Um, Welcome to Space News for this, uh, this month. And every time I think that there hasn't really been much this month, sure as eggs, uh, it takes me hours to prepare these things, and there has been. A lot of action. OK, let's start off with Australian space. Uh, Equatorial Launch Australia. Uh, and I actually looked up their address, and they're in Collins Street. So there you go. So maybe maybe you should go for a walk up there and say, is there any jobs going? But. Um, uh, there it is. They, they're proposing to put a launch uh, site up in Arnhem Land, right up there on the tip of uh, Australia, and uh, good, very close to the equator. Great for getting that Earth uh, orbit boost. Uh, and the idea is to launch sounding rockets from there. So, interestingly enough, NASA was uh, is looking to an Australian startup uh, to conduct sounding rocket launches. The guys from Goddard Space Flight Centre. Wallops uh, flight facility would like uh, to progress this in discussions with ELA on their 2020 sounding rocket campaign. Now that would provide them a uh, southern hemisphere launch facility for sounding rockets which is which is good. It would fall under the Space Activities Acts, there's two of them and they are being modified as we speak and the Australian Space Agency is responsible for that and so it's in the Australian Space Agency's interest to promote such a, uh, an activity. So, uh, good news. Uh, let's hope they get this thing off the ground. But it certainly seems like it's got legs. Uh, in Queensland, uh, experts will be encouraged to develop cutting-edge space rockets in Queensland, but authorities have been able, unable to find a launch site. So all of a sudden, everyone's looking for more launch sites around Australia. The Queensland government um, accepted a, a recent report uh, about job creation opportunities. Uh, and has pledged to explore ways to facili facilitate and encourage continued development of space rockets and hypersonic aircraft. As you may or may not know, but Queensland has been a, a prime uh, mover on hypersonics for many, many years. So uh, it's an obvious place to, um, uh, to, to promote it. But uh, attempts by government to find a suitable site just haven't uh, really come to fruition at the moment. Uh, again, Queensland, like Arnhem Land, has a, a good geographical uh, positioning. Uh, so, uh, but there's complications uh, such as you know operations, environment, uh, cultural matters, um, in, in particular with the traditional owners up there. So, they've got to work their way through it. However, the real epicentre of Australian space seems to be South Australia now. Uh, South Australia is boosting its credentials uh, by. Uh, with the state's budget allocating an extra 600000 to help entice international space companies to set up in Adelaide. Lot 14, which is a high-technology precinct, it's on the site of the former uh, Royal Adelaide Hospital, will be the hub for world-class research to drive technological innovations. The Australian Space Agency is located there too, by the way. Uh, the development of Lot 14 is a joint project of the South Australian Federal Governments through a 10-year, 551 million Adelaide City deal. So they're spending a bit of money on it. Um, 
and this is what it looks like. This is the development. That's on the um, uh, Adelaide Hospital site. Okay, that's Australian news. Let's go to Rocket Lab. There we have the usual pictures I show of the Electron rocket, and they launch from New Zealand on the east northeast coast, and they're about to launch a rocket. Uh, the next rocket launch from New Zealand comprises of seven small satellites, including a CubeSat, developed by, hey, students from Melbourne University. Congratulations to those guys. Um, the Electron rocket will be undertaken from the Launch Complex 1 on the Mahia Peninsula in uh, the North Island. Rocket Lab's third launch this year. It will uh, it'll set the pace of about one a month. Hopefully they'll be able to achieve it. Aboard, they've got uh, the Melbourne University flight, Crux-1. It's a CubeSat built by the engineering students there. And it's named after the brightest star in the Southern Cross and will test a CubeSat detumbling system. I'll show you that. Um, there's the CubeSat and there's uh, some uh, uh, people putting it together. Uh, but what I will show you is this is what it's meant to do. Um, have a look at this. <laughs> Just avoid listening to what okay, they so say. An electric current are in the loops. And the CubeSat de spins. So the idea with that is that uh, you launch the CubeSats and I presume through the Earth's magnetic field you can actually use it as a damper, which is a good little technique. It means you don't have moving parts, you just have magnetic fields do the work for you. Now to NASA. Always big news. In a recent tweet, President Trump appeared to signal a lack of support for NASA's current push to put people on the moon in 2024. As you know, there was a lot of PR and a lot of money spent on advertising that particular campaign. But Mr. Trump, in one tweet, uh, managed to really put the cat amongst the pigeons. The push that uh, he officially kicked off in December, or the NASA push, um, at, was, was uh, through his own sp Space Policy Directive 1 and was backed by proposed funding increase just last month. He tweeted, For all the money we are spending, NASA should not be talking about going to the moon. We did that 50 years ago. They should be focused on the much bigger things we are doing, including Mars, of which the moon is a, a part, defence and science. Uh, NASA has uh, organised its crew lunar plans into a program called Artemis, which includes the construction of small moon orbiting space station known as a gateway. NASA targeted the late 20s for the first accrued landing, but the timeline was recently moved up significantly when Vice President uh, uh, Pence instructed NASA to do it by 2024. Only recently, Trump gave an extra $1.6 billion, or proposed $1.6 billion. So this was all very contradictory stuff. Um, everyone went into, uh, you know, usual panic mode at NASA, and then uh, not long after, Jim, um, uh, Jim Bridenstein called uh, the moon a waypoint for Mars. During a town hall meeting at the Glenn Research Centre, Bridenstine said NASA was still committed to landing humans on the moon, despite a recent tweet from the president that suggested the agency was focusing too much on the moon. The moon is not our destination, he said. The moon is the waypoint uh, for missions to Mars, which remains a long-term destination for NASA human space flight, space flight program. Uh, since that, um, things are back on the rails again, and they're back to 2024. Um, going to the moon. Uh, amazing fella. Uh, US space policy continuing. A bipartisan group of senators was seeking to win passage of a commercial space bill by adding it into a Defence Authorisation Act. What a weird thing to do. But um, I'll go on. The, the group of senators, led by Texas Republican Ted Cruz, who was a presidential candidate, if you remember, introduced an amendment to the Senate version of the National Defence Authorisation Act that contains the text of the Space Frontiers Act. The Space Frontiers Act didn't get up uh, last year. 
It, uh, the bill seeks reforms to commercial launch and remote sensing regulations and extends the authorisation of the ISS to 2030. Okay? They couldn't do it through the, the normal route, so they're going through a Defence Act to do it. Attaching the Space Frontier, Frontier Act to the Defence Act could uh, be the means to sidestep judicial, uh, jurisdictional disputes in the House that derail passage of a version of this bill last year. Amazing how they work over there. Another one. An executive order could require NASA to cut some of its advisory committees. The executive order from President Trump recently directed that all federal agencies review advisory committees that operate under the federal uh, act there. Each agency is directed to cut at least one third of its existing committees. NASA currently has 12 such committees, including the NASA Advisory Council and the Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel. So they've got to cut four. Uh, that could have quite a significant impact on the way NASA operates. Moving on, Sp space station. Um, NASA recently rolled out a multi-pronged strategy for increasing commercial use of the International Space Station. NASA, NASA will allow greater commercial use of the station and it actually has published a price list um, and will also allow two private astronauts a year to visit the station on commercial crew vehicles for up to 30 days at a time. So if you've got, I don't know what the price tag is, but if you've got some money, you can go and spend it in the space station. Um, NASA will soon release solicitations for the use of the docking ports, etc. Other parts of the strategy will focus on stimulating commercial demand and better describing NASA's long-term demand for services in low Earth orbit. Um, so, all good stuff. NASA wants to commercialise the space station to reduce its, uh, uh, its drain on, uh, on, on costs. So, companies are interested in it. Uh, Big Low Aerospace, apparently, has actually paid significant deposits to buy some uh, uh, dedicated crew dragons um, and carry four people each to the station at a ticket price of $52 million per person. So that's a nice little number. The company said it welcomed NASA's uh, commercialisation strategy but said the devil is in the details. Surprise, surprise. Um, now, uh, US Government Accountability Office has uh, asked NASA to have a contingency plan. Um, the report noted that Boeing and SpaceX still have a lot uh, of work to do to get up to uh, actually having men go to the space station despite what you might might hear. A reiterated recommendations made nearly a year ago calling for contingency plans uh, to, uh, um, uh, to access uh, the ISS through Soyuz seats. NASA did recently purchase another two, uh, but uh, it's anybody's guess if that's enough. Um, an interesting thing that's going to be important in the future is uh, Startup has successfully tested satellite refueling technology on the station. Orbit Fab flew an experiment to the station and it demonstrated its ability, yes, to transfer water. Um, not really the hard, high, you know, fuels of uh, liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, but um, it's, a, it's a technique that they're really going to have to master, especially if they're going to go to the moon. Now, the Chinese have done it on their space station, uh, but the Americans have got to really rapidly get this technology up and running. Uh, as I said, uh, Artemis will absolutely require in-flight refueling. Commercial crew, big news. Um, in general, the ISS mission planning has revealed new target dates for commercial crew launches. Now this is again allied to other reports that we're getting where they're really falling behind. NASA has revised its visiting uh, vehicle plan for all upcoming and long-range missions to the ISS. The updates include new planning dates for the first commercial crews from SpaceX, Crew Dragon and Boeing Starliner, um, when US crew rotation flights are slated to begin, when Japan's newest version of the HTV cargo a vehicle will take flight and when Sierra Nevada um, Dream Chaser which is a little mini shuttle actually gets to uh, dock on the space uh, to the space station and make its first trip now let's go to Boeing where are we um, the new dates are the 17th of September for an uncrewed orbital flight test number one it's called uh, it's very much like SpaceX's uh, demonstration mission 
one, not two, one. Sometimes this year, there's going to be a pad abort test. No in-flight abort test will be done. At the end of 2019, there'll be the crewed OF2. Um, I doubt it'll be end of this year, but that's the kind of schedules people are still talking about. Early 2020s will be the second operational mission to the ISS. And um, so it, the crewed flight will probably go, um, the first crewed flight will probably go next year as well. This is the Starliner. This is what it looks like on top of its Atlas booster. Um, another bit of allied news is Boeing says it's moving its headquarters of its space and launch division to Florida. The company said recently it was moving the space division headquarters from Arlington, Virginia to Titusville. Those that know Titusville will, will uh, realise what an exciting town it really is. And, well, Boeing will be there doing its bit. So um, that's, that's good news. And it, it's good for the Space Coast because it, uh, we were there in 2010 and it was pretty down and out about that time. Took a few punches over the GFC, but uh, uh, it's good to see that they're now starting to really pick up. SpaceX, there's the, the real deal. DM1, DM1, as you remember, was a fantastic mission. But what's happened to them? Well, they're still talking. Uh, the, the orange one has happened, DM1. Sometimes 2019, we're going to get a, true, a Crew Dragon in flight abort test. That still hasn't been scheduled, and at some time, I would say, within the next six months. Um, they've put down a, a nominated date, the 15th of November for the actual crewed mission to the space station. However, they've got the elephant in the room. They're still trying to figure out why the Dragon capsule blew up. Nothing's come out yet on this. The first operational mission will be next year. So again, NASA administrator, he recently said uh, that yes, because of that uh, anomaly, as they call it, they don't like using the words blow up, uh, it certainly has delayed the program. Uh, they recently had the Paris Air Show where Bridenstine uh, made a number of comments, but again, no specifics on what's going on. Um, if you recall, the Crew Dragon anomaly happened on the 20th of April. I think they were shaking it at the time. And there you have it. I don't know if the people that took that video are still working at NASA, but... Uh, a couple of memos came out not long after saying that if you distribute videos like that, uh, consider yourself out of a job. SpaceX and NASA are still working, as I said, to work out the, the anomaly. Um, again, I can't really say much more about it because no details have been released, which is really quite unusual. You know, n normally SpaceX, when something like this happens, are usually quick. And NASA also, you know, they come clean. Beautiful arrangement. Couldn't think of anything better. Uh, SpaceX is, interestingly enough, when I put this article down, uh, they were still in the process of cleaning up where the accident happened, and it's near landing zone one. They must have cleaned all this up. So uh, they've actually cleaned it up. Why? Because tomorrow they're launching a Falcon Heavy, and two side boosters are going to be landing there. So if they hadn't have cleaned it up, they wouldn't be landing there. And there is the, um, the orange, I think, uh, represents very bad fuel scoping into the atmosphere. Hypergolics, you know, carcinogen uh, type uh, products that they use for the space program. Detol. Detol, oh yeah. I won't read any of that. Okay, so that was uh, commercial. Let's go to uh, space launch system. There it is. There's the Orion capsule. Um, NASA believes it still may be possible to launch the first SLS mission by the end of 2020, even if it retains a what's called the Green Run static fire test of the SLS core. So they still reckon they can do it because um, it is scheduled to go up next year. Uh, we'll have to see if that happens. This is a picture that kind of shows where they're, they're at. The capsule is going pretty well. The Orion service module, the stage adapter, you've got the uh, 
interim uh, uh, propulsion stage, cryogenic up, uh, propulsion, you've got the SLS adapter. In the old days on the Saturn Vs, that's where the lunar module used to sit. Um, then you've got the core stage, that's the hydrogen tank. I think they've just mated the oxygen tank to this thing. Uh, you've got uh, the forward join. I think that's where the motors go. Anyway, these are all the bits. They've got all the hardware, including the solid uh, boosters, as well as the mo mobile launcher. So they, they've got you know, all the hardware pretty well there. Now they're going to start to put it together. Whilst they're still uh, testing boilerplates, if you like, at Marshall Space Flight Centre shaking one of these to bits to see how it stands up. Again, um, the, the usual uh, government watchdogs, a recent report from the Government Accountability Office criticises rising costs and delays of NASA's next moon rocket. The report says that the giant SLS rocket has been beset by delays and spending overruns by almost 30%. Costs have risen from 6.2 to $8 billion, and we haven't seen the end of that. The delays threaten the 2024 timetable set by President Trump. Um, the first flight, which was set to take place in November 2018, a date later revised to June 2020, but even that target is now unlikely. Uh, it's probably not going to happen until June 2021. The program has been criticised by some in the space community as a patriotic patronage project kept alive because of its importance for jobs especially in Alabama the state represented by the senator who oversees appropriations including NASA's finances not to point the finger directly at anybody in particular so uh, that's been a common concern that the SLS uh, they used to call it the Senate launch system was very much a political um, outcome of keeping jobs at NASA rather than the necessarily the best way to go. But as Andrew pointed out in his presentation, these things are not about technical, uh, necessarily all about technical uh, uh, issues. They are a lot driven by political issues. Uh, the GAO uh, also accused NASA of being opaque. Holy cow, could you believe that? In its cost calculations. Orion costs have been have also increased, but God knows where all those cost numbers are. The report found that Boeing and Lockheed Martin received hundreds of millions of dollars in award fees for SLS and Orion, even though their program suffered schedule delays and cost overruns. The report recommended NASA find different ways to structure award fees to incentivise contractors to obtain better outcomes. Cost plus contracts don't always work. Um, again, NASA defended its position and kind of said, look, this is what happens when you have new programs. You know, this is bound to happen. And again, the GAO used unnecessarily negative land language to criticise the agency. This is, oh, uh, it's now called the Artemis One program. Uh, coming up in the next uh, week or so, we've got the Ascent Abort 2 test, which is now scheduled for the 2nd of July. AA2 will perform an in-flight test of Orion's launch abort system by launching a boilerplate Orion capsule on a solid rocket motor from Cape Canaveral. The launch abort system will activate at an altitude of ne nearly 10,000 metres, uh, testing its ability to pull an Orion spacecraft away. And that's what it's going to look like. This is the real McCoy sitting there, and this is a kind of a, a diagram of it. Uh, real McCoy, that's not like your your father's launch escape system. This thing has got some real brains behind it. Um, but launch escape systems go right back to the very early days. But this was a redstone mercury test and um, uh, this is what happened. Rocket fires, great. Sees a problem, shuts down, but the launch escape system worked brilliantly. There you have it. <laughs> Didn't pull the capsule off, no. This is very much like the old Apollo Little Joe flights that you would remember. But not to uh, understate the importance of a launch escape system, and uh, these guys can be thankful that they actually had a launch escape system. Uh, this was from the recent uh, MS-10 uh, flight where, if you recall, one of the boosters didn't separate properly, 
and uh, the launch escape system pulled them out of there. I think they were flying at about 12G or something for a few few seconds, so they really got a kick in the pants in doing it. Um, that's, that's what's going to happen. There are a series of tests that were done uh, a few years back. Uh, that's what it looks like, and... I don't know if I've shown this before. I know that the Orion launch escape is more powerful than the Mercury Redstone. It's a pretty powerful rocket. I believe it. I would believe it. Smart abort system. They did a paddleboard. Yeah, they did a paddleboard in 2010. There you go. So we'll see that in a few days. There is another one. What's the time? I've got 20 seconds. I might as well play it. Oh, this is... This is real hardware now. This was the uh, paddleboard test. There'd be some ride. That's it. I couldn't help admire the stability of those parachutes. If you know about the commercial uh, development of their parachutes, they'd be nothing but, but hell for both SpaceX and Boeing. Those parachutes remind me of the Apollo ones. Nice and stable and uh, well done. That's NASA. All right, that's it. Thank you.
Yeah, yeah, but under NASA spec. Whilst the new, whilst the new space, uh, they've got some conditions, but NASA's buying rides. Well, they've had trouble with Boeing Starliner. Okay, Andrew, all yours. Thanks for that. Uh, now we've got our last uh, segment for this evening. Uh, Andrew Rennie with his planetary and space on. You all good? Uh, yes, yeah, someone. Oh. Mike is. Do they get copied on or? Last one. March, April, May. Are you sure it's in the last ones? <laughs> okay, what we're waiting for is to uh, oh, here it is. get the presentation from last month. If I seem a little vague on some points, it's because some of this presentation was actually prepared for the April meeting. And I did that in the middle of March. Oh, good. All right, is this the one? Okay. All Looks right, like so we're ready to go. Give me a second to give you a thumbs up, and then. Okay, I'll give you a second one. Mississippi, two Mississippi, Mar three Murrumbidgee, four Murrumbidgee, five Murrumbidgee, six Murrumbidgee. You know where to learn. Yeah, I used to say Mississippi, but then I realised that oh, that's American. Not putting American. Okay, ready? Right. Let's go. And that's the one thing I did get to show you last time, so here we go. In, um, uh, in March, in, uh, yeah, early, early April, I think it was, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory issued some contracts or study contracts for a number of missions that uh, they might do in the future. And one of them is for these little winged craft that could fly through the atmosphere of Venus or Jupiter or Saturn and do studies of the atmosphere. Another one was to um, beam down power to a craft by in Venus's atmosphere. And the idea is that this thing would uh, go up to where the sunshine, recharge, then sink down, and then transfer its power by wireless things. And if you thought that was uh, funny, I was in a, a, a pseudo restaurant the other day, and they had these things that you could put a mobile phone down on and recharge it by wireless. Yeah, so wireless transmission. Anyway, uh, so transmit that, and then we keep the, uh, the lander on the surface going, and then it could go up, and this could go on for a while until finally the heat overcame the thing. Space Deployment Assembly in Orbit. Now this is, um, as you can read from the thing there, what it's going to do. It's basically a high-performance um, high astronomy mission in a fairly small object. This one is to look for exoplanets using spectroscopy and measuring the radial velocity method. So you get broadband coming in and then it's focused down uh, onto the receiver. This one, the microprobes propelled and powered by planetary atmospheric electricity. So these things would be basically like loops of wire and they could float in uh, Jupiter's atmosphere and because Jupiter's got lots of storms in its atmosphere, we can detect those storms, even a radio, ordinary radio on Earth can detect these storms, the crackling coming from Jupiter. So they would float in the atmosphere and um, be propelled by these electric storms that are there. 
In this proposal, we've got a, a swarm of CubeSats to sample the plume on, uh, I think it's Europa, and sample what's in the, in the plume to find out what's in the ocean below. And this is an ultra lightweight nuclear electric propulsion probe for deep space exploration, it's called. This is an innovative power system where they'd use a ripcord to uh, float down in an atmosphere with a balloon. They're even thinking of interstellar missions. Now, I reckon the interstellar missions are a load of baloney and I think it will never happen. But anyway, the tour, JPL is putting some money into research on how it might happen. And uh, this is a, an idea of how you might propel an interstellar probe using a laser and particle beam transmitter. Again, it's getting, I reckon it's into science fiction, but oh well, they're putting some, JPL's putting some money into it. This is more, more realistic, I think. Uh, what we've got here is we're in one of those dark craters at the north or south pole of the moon uh, in a shadowed crater. And what you do is you put up these masts so that the solar arrays are in perpetual sunlight. And um, that could go quite high. Remember, it's got lunar gravity of uh, only 1.6 newtons per kilogram, whereas the Earth is 9.8 newtons per kilogram gravitational field strength. So the lightweight towers could hold these things up. And then they power from that could use um, propel the things on your base there that's in the, dark, in the permanent shadow. The, another one is to detect solar neutrinos. Now solar neutrinos is a great puzzle. Uh, what happens to the neutrinos coming out of the sun? And uh, this craft would be in orbit around the sun. It would be in heliocentric orbit. Back to the moon again. And uh, well actually we could uh, do this on some of the moons of uh, Saturn or Jupiter and we've got thermal mining of ices on a cold solar system body so what we've got is these collectors of sunlight at the top and they're beaming it down into the crater where um, it's being used. Inverse well or the further from the sun the less effective that's going to be so I'm not sure what size mirrors you're going to need on the moons of Saturn or something like that. Well the moon wouldn't be, need to be terribly big but on on, uh, if you're on some of the moons of Saturn, remember the gravitational field is so small I mean, you're not that you not you you need. Well, of course, so that means that you know you're um, you know the inverse square law. Is that you've got half the uh, if you go twice the distance, you've got a quarter the strength, so you need four times the collecting area. So it's all you know. Anyway, JPL's put some money into this uh, concept to see if it works out. These are only, uh, you know, to do to the design work. It's not to, not to actually build the things. Uh, uh, small sats are, of course, the, the name of the game these days, and so this is a way to explore the solar system's boundaries by sending out a whole lot of small satellites or small probes out. Uh, this one would come into one solar radii of the sun. Now. The solar Parker, the Parker solar probe is going as close as eight solar radii. So this is called a solar surfer. Okay, and of course to do that it needs a very highly reflective coating. Now, um, moving into other pictures now. Uh, this is the um, carbon dioxide. And you see that China is a big emitter of carbon dioxide. And uh, this is detected by the OCO satellite, the Orbiting Carbon Observatory, which is a NASA satellite. And uh, this is the average over the whole world. And hopefully that's animating. Yep. All right. Okay. Oh, by the way, we left the JPL things now. We're now into our general uh, space report for May. And here's a um, carbon dioxide emissions over Europe. Again, you see that um, Germany's Ruhr Valley is quite a heavy 
emitter of carbon dioxide. Over the Middle East, <coughs> and um, again, I, I remember flying over the Persian Gulf at night, and the whole Gulf was just the light with, with you know, the, the methane being burnt off. I know that, and I was about to come to that, Len. Uh, I'm just saying that they seem to have, um, on the evidence of this, uh, stopped doing that practice now in the Middle East. I haven't been there since uh, the 1980s. But um, you can see that uh, there's still a lot of burning of material going on in uh, Iraq, as Len has pointed out. Oh, by the way, down in Africa, you can see there, that's, I think that's mainly agricultural burning. Uh, this one, oh, I've forgotten what this one is. It's um, plots of carbon dioxide, again, I think, uh, over, San, over the United States, San Gabriel Mountains in Los Angeles. Yeah, okay. And again, the United States, where their emissions are. Now, there's another satellite called ICESAT. And it measures with a, laser, with a LIDAR. That's a light radar, which uh, goes down and they pick up the reflection. And from that, they can work out the profile on the ground. And this is um, s some plots over uh, Safe Harbor in uh, Pennsylvania. And uh, this is the result. And you can see the height of things. Now, they can measure the height of trees and things because the, the LIDAR reflects both off the leaves of the trees and also penetrates down to the ground and reflects off the ground. So the solid plot there is the ground and uh, you've got the, the upper canopy of the trees as well. So this is uh, now flying around the world and can measure forests anywhere in the world. This is a, a track across Antarctica and across the Ross Ice Shelf. And you see it's quite sensitive, and at one point there, it's even picked up the, the, the ice rise there, there. But then when it hits the, the mountains here, boom, you really get uh, quite a showing. And here's another one across uh, Antarctica, and this is the Weddell Sea area. And uh, quite interesting what you can see in that plot. And this is another ISAT-2 plot, uh, this time in uh, South America, I think. No, sorry? No, wrong place. Pacific Ocean. All right, and this is the Antarctic ice loss and how it contributes to the rise in sea level. The world is warming up, and the Arctic is a particular uh, thermometer of that warming. And this shows the changes in ground temperature. Uh, so this is the mean annual ground temperature. I forget which year it is. I did know when I put this in. Uh, but you can see that there's quite a lot. It's pretty cold in Siberia and northern Canada. And this is in Siberia and shows the changes in temperature where ice is, where the um, permafrost is melting and the temperatures are changing and vegetation is uh, changing as a result. We're also getting um, lots of sinkholes and things where the ice permafrost is melting and leaving little lakes and uh, this is what it looks like on the ground where you've got that melted permafrost melting away. To Australia, and this is after the floods in Queensland, and this is uh, mud coming down from the rivers in um, Queensland and heading towards. Fortunately, at the time this photo was taken, it was missing the Great Barrier Reef. It was staying pretty close to the coast, but it would have been pretty devastating had it gone onto the reef itself and um, done that reef, because the reef damage is, is a critical problem here in Australia. Now we are looking at um, 
Los Angeles with a uh, it's an infrared <coughs> sorry it's, a, it's an infrared camera from a CubeSat now this sort of thing you would have built a huge military spacecraft in the 1960s and it would have been classified now any Joe Bloggs almost can put up a CubeSat and get this sort of result this one just caught my eye, put it in because I like uh, Cape, um, Cape Horn, South America, next to Antarctica, and the Straits of Magellan. And yeah, I reckon it'd be great fun to go there and uh, sail amongst those things. The red, by the way, is, is vegetation. All right, moving on. Um, the... Oh, I've forgotten the name of it now. The um, the GRACE satellites. The GRACE satellites have measured the <coughs> gravitational field, and this shows the anomalies of the gravitational field around the world. And it nicely shows up the subduction zones and also the uh, you know the mountain ranges and things like that. So, uh, if you want to go to a high gravity area, go to northern Australia. Now, Chung a four. This is a profile showing the landing of the Chong A4, and I did refer to this several months ago, how if, instead of coming down and just coming, like if you watch my hand here, just coming in slowly like Apollo, um, it flew along, hovered, and then came almost straight down. So that's uh, to scale what happened. And you can see the height of the mountains there, it had to clear 4,000 meter high mountains and go into a 6,000 meter deep uh, crater. And this is where it was. And this is on the back of the moon, by the way. And that's um, w w you know, part of its track. And he this is some of the pictures from May of the uh, row from Utu as it roved around the moon. Uh, yeah, okay, you say, oh yeah, it's just moon pictures, but that was pretty fantastic. And uh, <coughs> there's its tracks. For some reason, it does these pirouettes. So it goes along and then, and then it goes along. And, and here's some more of these pictures, like here, you can see them again. Every few metres, it seems to do a circle. <laughs> um, and there's another one. Now, one of the things it did find is evidence that this um, hydrated, uh, so highland material, different material than in the lowlands. And we've got the spectra here of those. I won't go into the details of this. So you can look that up if you want. And there's a different spectra, which I was going to talk about more in detail. So it's doing good work. All right. Now, this little craft, Lady, the lunar and the dust um, collector. And what happens is um, it, it flew around the moon. When Brian O'Brien did his lunar dust experiments on Apollo, NASA hushed it up. They refused to let him publish the data because it didn't suit NASA's story that dust was not a problem. Dust was a big problem on Apollo and it will be a big problem anyone who goes there. So NASA finally woke up and they sent this spacecraft called Lady. Now, L-A-D-E-E. -E. And what they've found is that meteorite impacts on the moon kick up dust. And Lady, in flying along, was able to plot the profile of that dust <coughs> even in its, at its orbital altitude. So this dust goes up quite a high height. Wishing through, um, this is the um, comet Chiriumov of Gerasimenko and the Rosetta mission and some of the findings. Now, there's big arguments at the time as to how it formed. And here is the, um, the latest scientific findings is that it's formed by erosion away. Uh, there are two parts that had stuck together, but then they began to erode away at the neck. 
And now on to the um, Hayabusa 2 mission and the impactor that was sent down and created a crater, which you see on the right hand side there. This is the impactor on the way in. This is the crater it made. And you can see the difference between before and after. And we've got to the, uh, the Hayabusa went and hid behind the thing so it wouldn't get hit by any of the dust, but it did see some of the dust coming out, the ejector coming out from behind the uh, object, and you can see uh, in the picture there, just here. It's showing on the. Oh, you can't see the cursor. Oh well. Very quickly, because I've got to finish. That's the material coming out there, and you can see it over here. Okay. All right. Another picture of that. And again, you can see the material coming out. So it, it did create a bit of a crater and uh, material was ejected. All right. More material coming out. Now, finally, look at the shape of that. Now, this thing is not round. It's not circular. And it's got this middle a middle-aged bulge around the middle and the reason is it's spinning and the scientific paper has been published which explains why it's got this shape and the answer is that it's a rubble pile it's a pile of um, boulders and rocks and things and dust and it's because it's spinning it's got this bulge there okay so that's the scientific results uh, Jupiter the uh, the great red spot seems to be disappearing and uh, there's some photos from the ground have been uh, showing it and the flyby which is coming up in a few weeks I think is going to have another look at the great red spot and see if they can see the changes. Uh, some pictures from Jupiter, from Juno. Uh, this is from the ground and shows the auroral bands and we can see there the auroral bands at uh, different um, dates and times and there is a soundtrack that goes with that, but I won't play it, which shows the um, moons, the, the, the Mars quake. They had a, a Mars quake measured with the InSight mission. And um, they've decided the new future path of the uh, uh, Curiosity rover and where it's going to go. And it's a nice little movie on the JPL website, if you want to look at it, uh, which flies around this website and explains it all. Uh, um, That's a comparison, before and after comparison, with the different uh, types of geology there. And uh, the Mars uh, Odyssey, uh, 2001, named after Arthur Clarke's story, um, has made some observations of Phobos recently and measured its temperature. And here's one of Phobos itself, just one picture there. And uh, that's a close-up of it. So it has temperature variations. And uh, this is a little animation showing the movement of Phobos in the sky. I won't show the whole movie because I'm going to finish up here. Okay. And here's some scientific papers that have been published recently. Uh, Planet-wide groundwater system exists on Mars. It's been found out. And um, there's uh, explanations of where it ha occurs, and there's evidence. They give this paper gives evidence of it, and pointing to various features on Mars that shows there is a groundwater system there, and it's below the level of about I think it's five kilometres. And um, more of the features on Mars that show that there was a groundwater system that's planet-wide, and they've got dozens, dozens more pictures if you look in the paper. Um, yeah, okay, and on the thing, if you remember the days when, uh, you know, you get one guy in the laboratory, um, you know, stirring up stuff like Madame Curie, and uh, the paper is published with just two names on it, well, this is the name of the game these days, there's uh, a couple hundred names there for the New Horizons mission. Anyway, this is the geology of the Ultima Thule object, and 
This is a picture from, yeah, I've forgotten already. Uh, oh yeah, finding out the Hubble constant by looking at a small patch of the sky and uh, come up with uh, a new way to measure the Hubble constant. And finally, uh, this is the Indian um, ASAT test they did, and this is the, the plot of the debris decay. Now, India said the whole lot would be gone within uh, 30 or 40 days, and it's still there. And a lot of it is way, way above. The, the green line, by the way, is the International Space Station. The red line is the original uh, orbit of the uh, Indian satellite. And that's it. Yes. The latest uh, methane results, curiosity. Can you shed some light on Methane results on? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Apparently they had a nice whiff of uh, uh, methane, quite significant amounts of methane. When? Um, oh, probably last week. <coughs> it was yeah, reported no. last week of recent results where the methane was three times higher than been measured on Mars before. Methane does not last, it breaks down, so therefore it's been produced, it's coming from somewhere. So there's the, 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 the two main mechanisms is biological yeah. and the other one is a geochemical where uh, basically water runs down into hot rock and gets converted into methane and uh, oxygen or something and it leaks out. So those are the two main mechanisms but I haven't come here to be equipped today to talk okay. about that because that's, that's excellent. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much, Andrew. Well, that brings us to a close. Two l little things. Um, one, you may or may not have noticed my T-shirt. Uh, John Hopkins got one as well. We separately went to the uh, Brisbane Museum, and they've got a thing called the NASA the Human Adventure exhibition up there, and it's fantastic. I thought it was going to be a bit hokey and whatever, but it's a lot of stuff from uh, Huntsville, I think. Um, and some of the exhibits they got stuff that was carried by Dave Scott on the lunar surface collecting moon rocks and there's all sorts of really interesting things so if you're in Brisbane any time I think it's here till October give yourself a couple of hours and have a good look through there's some there's some full-scale mock-ups of Apollo Gemini and Mercury capsules but there's also as I say flown stuff other stuff there as well uh, the other thing is uh, tomorrow afternoon I think it's uh, 1 30 local time the up and heavy's going off, but th theoretically. And then I think next Tuesday, Wednesday is Rocket Labs with their uh, ACRUX uh, Melbourne Space Program uh, satellite. Um, that's it for tonight. We'll see you next month at the July 22 meeting, the day after our moon landing live. Uh, once again, if you're interested in going along for that, uh, the uh, tickets are available for sale through well your email. Uh, you get that discount code or uh, just go to the website, uh, Sun Theatre. Thank you very much to the speakers, Andrew, Angelo, uh, Ashley for your work, uh, Michael for putting all the program together, and uh, James, James I think is gone already. Yeah, and uh, we'll see you uh, next month.